just want to thank Davis and our great event staff and Susan Call, who is our director of events, um, for all that they do to make these events uh, go off and and get all of you in here. So thank you all for coming. Um, as Davis said, I'm Lisa Muscatine. I'm one of the co-owners of the store, uh, along with my husband, Brad Graham, who's right over here. Um, and we are so delighted to um, be able to host Mark Landler tonight. Uh, I think he has many friends in the audience, I suspect. I suspect he also has a few sources. You do not have to raise your hands, that's okay. Um, for those of you who don't know Mark, um, I guess the best way to describe him is that he's one of the most respected uh, journalists in the country. He work, has worked for nearly a quarter of a century for the New York Times um, as a business reporter, bureau chief in Hong Kong and Frankfurt, European economic correspondent, White House correspondent, and for the past five years as the paper's diplomatic correspondent, uh, covering both the White House and the State Department <coughs> during that time. And it's in uh, this most recent assignment uh, that he's gained much of the reporting for the book that he'll be talking about tonight. As Davis said, it's called Alter Egos, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and the Twilight Struggle Over American Power. This is Mark's first book. Um, it is truly, I'm gonna make him blush, uh, it's, it's really a triumph of, uh, of, of journalism, quite honestly. Uh, it's full of superb reporting, uh, great storytelling, and something even rarer uh, in the kind of uh, journalism and reporting we're all subjected to kind of nonstop 24-7 these days, which is even-handedness. Um, and that's not at all to say that alter egos is dry or boring, quite the contrary. It's fascinating, it is highly entertaining, um, even riveting at times. Um, and it offers a sober look at the strengths and weaknesses of and the relationship between two of the most influential leaders of our time, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> and of course, uh, as we all know, it could not be more timely with the presidential election only five months away and both Clinton and Obama featuring prominently in that race. Uh, tonight, I am, I usually am up here introducing authors and tonight I am uh, lucky enough not only to introduce Mark, but also to join him in conversation, and you may be wondering why I am doing that, so this is gonna be the sort of full disclosure moment of the event. Um, Mark and I first, I think we first met in 2009, right? Yeah, at the beginning of the Obama administration. Uh, Mark was covering uh, the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. I was her chief speechwriter, which was a position I had held for her over many, many years, going back to the White House in 1993, on and off, by the way. Um, and so I just wanna say up front, I am an unabashed, long time, full-fledged Hillary person. Um, so, I do tolerate other points of view though, so you know, it's okay. <laughs> well, except maybe one, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, I, and I'm also, also a former journalist, uh, albeit at the Washington Post and not the New York Times, and as many of you know, as I just uh, introduced Brad, uh, he was a reporter at the Post for several decades before we became owners of the source. So let me just say up front, I am sympathetic to the press, uh, two reporters. I'm married to one. I was even once one myself. Um, that said, I quickly made it a habit to avoid talking to the press ever, pretty much, uh, once I left journalism and got into politics and government. Uh, Mark was one of the rare exceptions. Um, I spoke to him a number of times uh, before he was writing the book and then I was interviewed for the book. But I think what's more important isn't sort of my situation, but the fact that such a huge number of people high up in the administration, both at the State Department and at the White House, spoke to him on the record for this book. And I think it's a testament to the trust and confidence that so many in Washington have in his reporting and writing. And I want to just also say that I doubt that anybody who was interviewed for the book um, agreed completely and absolutely uh, with everything that he said. And in fact, there are places in here where you know I was cringing and I was dismayed at the accuracy and honesty of what he was saying. Um, but you know, he certainly earns our respect for his fairness and judiciousness, uh, for his independ independent mindedness, his open mindedness, and for providing a much needed deeper and more complete understanding of how two historic figures uh, came together to navigate the ship of foreign policy in very, very rough seas. So for me, it is not only a professional pleasure, but also a personal pleasure to host Mark here tonight. And I have to say, it's a great relief to be talking to you as a bookseller and not as a source. 
So anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, Lissa, thank you so much. I, I'm not sure there's a more complex uh, relationship I had with anyone on the book than someone who is bo both a source and the one of the premier distributors of the final product. <laughs> And, but there's no and, conflict um, of interest whatsoever. And, and I do recall coming here about a year ago at this time and meeting Lissa in this store. And on the way out of the store, she said, well, I haven't really decided yet whether we'll even carry this um, <laughs> book. But she agreed to talk to me for it. Um, and, uh, and I think the placement's OK. So, But I don't want to read anything into the placement, because if it's too good, it may mean I wasn't hard enough on Hillary. So, um. <laughs> he is very, like I said, he's very even-handed. No, honestly, that is what makes this book so great. You, you have some pretty tough shots at both of them, both Obama and Hillary. Um, and I think it's a, a great exposure, and honest exposure, of, of their weaknesses and their strengths. And I think they both have both, right? They're human beings. They're dealing with unbelievably difficult challenges. And what it makes this book so great and so interesting is that he really, really kind of deconstructs and gets to the worldviews that they brought to their respective positions. And we all sort of know the superficialities of those, but, he, but Mark really helps, under, uh, helps us understand those. And he does it through incredible behind the scenes stories. I mean, this is a great book about how foreign policy is conducted. The characters, the people, the events, how things get thrown off balance at, the, you know, at various moments. So it, it is a real triumph, and I wasn't kidding about that. But I do, before we get started, do you want to just say a little bit about why you decided to write the book? Because um, this is not an easy subject, let's face it. Well, partly every other reporter in my part of the newsroom had already written one, and uh, <laughs> I had deep feelings of inadequacy. Um, beyond honest. that, though, what, what was interesting about uh, covering Clinton and Obama sequentially uh, was that all of us who were assigned to cover Hillary Clinton in 2009 sort of were rubbing our hands together because the 08 election had been so bitter that we felt that inevitably uh, it would be a pretty tempestuous time between the State Department and the White House. Can you hear him in the back? No? Uh-oh. Okay. Now you can hear me, though, right? OK. okay. So um, we expected that it would be there would be a lot of backbiting, a lot of leaks, um, that some of the bitterness of the campaign would inevitably show up in the relationship. And, and some people even thought it would all end in tears, and she would resign or be fired. Um, and, and I think, and there's a couple people in this audience who were with me in those early days, we, we were all sort of immediately disappointed when we realized that none of that was going to happen. <laughs> and that, in fact, on the contrary, it was going to be kind of incredibly tranquil waters, um, a lockstep administration, no drama Obama, um, Hillary playing, you know, as she has at other times in her life, the good soldier, being extremely loyal. And so, um, you know, that didn't end up being a story at all for the first two years I was on the State Department beat. Um, but as I went over to the White House and got to know the staffs of both of these principles better and began to get behind the scenes a little bit, I realized that the surface tranquility um, covered some interesting and I felt significant differences in point of view and even in worldview and in views of America's uh, proper role in foreign conflicts, the use of the military um, among the other tools and uh, including diplomacy. And so I felt that there was a, a, a more interesting nuanced relationship to explore. Um, and so as I hit sort of the fourth year on the White House, and it became fairly clear, even though it was not formally the case at that point that Hillary Clinton would run for president, that it would be a good time to write a book that really got underneath the surface and tried to explore how they, the different views they brought of American power, and also the role that Hillary had played in the big war and peace debates of the first term, and to the extent possible, how much of a roadmap that provided to what kind of a president or commander in chief she would be. So that was that was really the idea behind the book. You know, before we get into the substance of the book, I, I have thought about this a lot because the reporting in it really is the detail is incredible. And as I said, a lot of people talk to you. But, you know, when you just sort of step back and having been on the outside as a reporter back in my day, but now also on the inside, you know, both of these universes, the Clinton and Obama universes, are notoriously tight-lipped, notoriously leak-averse. 
and notoriously controlling of whatever gets out. So uh, that kind of sounds like a reporter's nightmare to me. No? Well, one of the advantages, it is, it is. And I think most White House correspondents will tell you this has been a more challenging White House than, than most in the recent history because of their success at keeping a lid on the kind of news that reporters thrive on, um, which is to say dissent, gossip, all that sort of thing. Um, and likewise, um, the Clinton ship at state, it may not have been as much true of the 2008 campaign, but it was true at state, was also a fairly locked down operation. I think the advantage that I had um, in doing this book is that as a State Department correspondent, I spent you know, dozens and dozens of hours on airplanes flying around the world with the secretary and her closest advisors. And, and you know, just through all of those hours of of um, you know, sitting in this old Bo Boeing 767, 757, we got to know each other well, and I think that's how I was able to build the relationships that allowed me to penetrate a little further than you would typically get. Uh, and likewise with the White House, just it was partly longevity, partly all these hours on the road. Um, I really was able to get to know the two teams, and I think get a little bit further behind the curtain. And there is also that. Uh, sort of age-old tru truism in Washington that eventually people just want to be in the story, right? I mean, they want to make sure their point of view is expressed, so the more you know, the more you get other people to And to also, the, the closer you get to the end of an administration, the more you see people wanting to, uh, you know, really set the terms of their own legacy, and I think I benefited from that as well. I did want to just ask you uh, about the title of the book, the subtitle in particular. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually looked at the book or you've seen the title page, which is, as I said uh, before, um, the subtitle is Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and the Twilight Struggle over American Power. And uh, I don't know how many of you have opened the book, but if you do, you'll see that uh, Twilight Struggle is a phrase from um, JFK's inaugural address in 1961. And Mark uh, quotes it at the very beginning, now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though embattled we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle. And I'm just wondering why you chose that for, to put in the title of the book. Um, I, I think what struck me about the, the long twilight struggle is something, a phrase I always loved, um, and, and I thought it was very, appropriate to describe this time. In 1961, Kennedy meant it to describe the, the Cold War and the battle against um, communism and the forces of tyranny. Uh, and you know, so he was characterizing a period of time where it was a sort of a low-grade battle. It wasn't an all-out war like World War II, uh, but neither was it a period of peace and tranquility. And I thought in a way that was appropriate to the period we're in now, uh, particularly the war against uh, or the battle, a campaign against um, the Islamic State and the forces of militant um, Islamic militancy ar around the world, I felt like there were some of the same characteristics where um, we're not at war in the national mobilization, World War II sense of the word, but we are clearly in this long, low-grade battle that shows no signs of abating and which will uh, you know, dominate the next president as surely it is, as it has dominated this president. And that's, that's what the, the illusion was. I know some people read it as twilight meaning American decline. I, I didn't mean it in that context. I was aware people might read it in that context. I didn't really want to get into the debate over whether the country's in decline. That's a debate that gets conducted perennially. People have strong views on both sides. Um, and it really wasn't so much about that as the notion of this long struggle. Um, no, that's interesting because I, I was wondering exactly about which of those of those meanings you had intended. Um, the other thing that comes through in this book that I found really interesting, I'm not sure why I hadn't thought about it quite as much uh, until I read the book. Uh, we, we hear about all these divergences between uh, Clinton and Obama. And we also know there are a lot of similarities. They're both Democrats. They both have backgrounds in advocacy. They're both lawyers who have a sort of reverence for rules and the law. Um, they both have fairly shared values and ideals about the role of government, I would say. Um, but they diverge in a number of places. And one of the places that really comes through in the book that was interesting to me is this generational divide between them. And I'm wondering sort of where that ranks among the differences uh, between them 
in terms of their approach to foreign policy. Obviously, we see it in their view of the post-Cold War world, even in the way they relate to foreign leaders of different ages, right? I mean... Absolutely. Yeah. And I think probably the... I, I sort of uh, posit that there are geographic and generational and cultural differences between them that are all uh, all contribute to their different worldviews. And I'll quickly summarize those worldviews just so we're clear what I'm talking about. With, with Hillary Clinton, I think she's a sort of a classic post-World War II, America as the indispensable nation. I think she tends to believe that American intervention in the world is generally a positive thing um, and, that, and that interventions generally can end well. That doesn't mean they always do, but that they can. Um, and, and she brings that sort of classic optimism about American values. Uh, and I'll get to the generational piece in a second. With Obama, I think he's much more uh, ambivalent about that. I think he, uh, because of growing up uh, in Hawaii and spending part of his childhood in Indonesia, he brought a, a little more of an expatriate's view of the United States and the U.S. role in the world. And I think he's just far more skeptical that intervention uh, will end well. I think he, uh, you know, s his his formative experience is the Iraq War, which ended, you know, disastrously. So I think that that's. In a, in a nutshell, how I see their different worldviews. Where the generational thing is critical, I think, is that Clinton had, in addition to growing up in a, in a post-World War II home with an, a Navy petty officer father and, and having a kind of a sense and a respect and even reverence for the military in her early childhood, um, you know, she obviously then had her very well publicized transition and transformation during the Vietnam era. But then later, and I think this is critical, as First Lady, she actually saw her husband intervene with good effect in the Balkans, and in so doing, uh, changed the narrative. The Democratic Party had been you know, tethered for years to the record of failure in Vietnam, and had grown to doubt its own instincts in foreign affairs. And Republicans had used that very successfully against Democrats in successive elections. What Bill Clinton's Balkans intervention did is, for the first time in a generation, give a positive example of where humanitarian but military intervention can work. Um, and I think Hillary Clinton not only drew deeply from that, but, but in fact pushed her husband in some cases in this area, and, and Alyssa was there for this and probably no, you know, can attest to it. Um, Obama missed that entirely. Obama was during those years a state senator uh, in Illinois and a law professor at the University of Chicago. I think for him the Balkans uh, is, a, is a distant chapter, w one which he hasn't really drawn that deeply of in formulating his own worldview. So where does his worldview come from? Well, it comes from overwhelmingly from Iraq. Not only did Iraq open the door to the presidency for him, it, it became the template um, by which he really judged almost all his foreign policy decisions. Uh, and, and I think to some extent that saved him from a lot of terrible errors. But you could probably also make the argument that his policy to a fault became not Iraq. Um, and I think that Hillary Clinton had, because she just had a longer history and a broader frame of reference, she could hearken back to the Balkans uh, in a way that he could not. And I think that's an important generational difference between the two of them. Yeah, and I would just add, um, I think you're absolutely right, Mark, that the Balkan success d does weigh very heavily in her mind still to this day. Um, and did throughout. Also, the failure of non intervening in Rwanda, I think, haunted her husband. And he has um, said, you know, it was the gravest, uh, his gravest regret of his presidency. So those two combined, I think, um, definitely fueled that. And just, you know, again, always in my effort to be sort of even handed here, the Balkans may have contributed to leading her in a to a disastrous decision on, on the original vote to authorize the Iraq War. Because I do recall the fact that in the fateful speech she gave in the well of the Senate for why she was voting in favor of that, of that war, uh, she cited very heavily the Kosovo example where her husband decided when he was faced with an, a, a, a certain veto in the UN Security Council that he was going to unilaterally uh, support that bombing uh, operation. And that weighed very heavily in that decision, a decision that you know she obviously came to regret and apologized for years later. Yeah, no, ex exactly right. You know, just um, to digress for one second, you mentioned 
uh, her father being um, in the Navy as a petty officer, and this sort of notion of, of military people around her. And in the book, you get into some detail about her interesting relationship with the military press. I mean, and I think it was something that always kind of was fascinating to me, honestly. She kind of really likes the military guys, and they really like her. You have a, you talk a lot about her relationship with General Jack Keane, who um, be, has become almost like an advisor to her over many, many years. But I was just, it made me wonder, uh, Obama never has had anything comparable to that, correct? Well, yes. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say he has not. But I think you have to sort of add quickly that he did develop um, confidence and some sense of, of comfort with a number of his advisors, Martin Dempsey being one. Um, but it is true that I the military commanders that Obama has tended to like and gravitate toward are the ones that reinforce his pre-existing instincts. And maybe that's true of Hillary as well. He likes Martin Dempsey, who's a, a very cautious, reserved, um, you know, a, a commander who's reluctant about using military force unless absolutely necessary. Um, with Hillary, and, and I do devote a chapter to this because I think it's fascinating, um, there are a number of commanders with whom she has um, decade or longer relationships with where she meets them, you know, regularly for drinks or dinner and discusses uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, all the major issues. And Jack Keane is the one that I tended to focus on the most because I think her, arguably, he's got the largest influence on her. And to the, I don't know how many people in this store are Fox viewers. I'm going to guess it's probably a smaller percentage than in the nation as a whole. But if you turn on Fox on any, on, on any night of the week, almost, uh, Jack Keane is on it. Um, and the reason I know that is because I've actually been in a few green rooms lately at Fox, and I've run into him twice. So he haunts the halls of Fox. Um, he is a, a decorated former Army Vice Chief of Staff. He's importantly the architect of the Iraq surge. He is the person that went into the Oval Office and really persuaded George W. Bush to surge troops into Iraq in 2007. Um, he is also a New Yorker, a native New Yorker, uh, and got to know Hillary when she was a senator from New York. And she, despite splitting with him on the surge, because if you recall, she opposed the surge, um, uh, she has taken a l spent a lot of time with Jack Keene over the years. Uh, and in fact, uh, I saw him, I guess, this time last year. And he dropped that he had just spent two and a half hours with her discussing the Islamic State and what to do about Syria. And one of the things he advised uh, in this meeting was that she should advocate in favor of a partial no-fly zone to open these humanitarian corridors in Syria. And a few months later, uh, she came out in favor of that position, a position, by the way, that's not shared by President Obama. So he's one of the characters. I, I also write about Petraeus. All of you know a lot more about Petraeus, um, and, as well as some of the other generals. But I just think that this is a very interesting uh, part of her that's that's worth knowing as you assess what kind of a commander in chief she would be. You know, it's, it just reminded me that in 2008, you may remember this or not because it wasn't that important. But she was very proud of the many uh, generals who endorsed her. You know, and she sort of kept a chat, you know, how it was like 25, 30, I don't know. It turned out to be a lot. And it really mattered to her a lot. And not just yeah. for her bona fides as, you know, the first woman to be commander in chief, but I think just because of this interesting sort of relationship that she's, she's had. I, I want to ask a, a question about the Middle East because um, obviously a lot of the book is devoted to not just um, Israel uh, and, and, um, and that section of the world, but also Iran and Libya and Syria, and uh, what might be called the quagmires of that region. And you know, you say in the book when you get to the Benghazi part of it um, that the unfolding of I'm paraphrasing, but the unfolding events in Libya culminating uh, with Benghazi raise the most basic questions about the limits of liberal interventionism in the age of Obama. And you sort of raise the question of why did our intervention there? leave the place in shambles. And the next question, um, I guess, could be um, about our non-intervention or very tiny, very late role in Syria. And you quote uh, the last American ambassador to Syria, Robert Ford, as saying that Hillary thought of Syria as a raging bull that we have to get a rope around or we have no chance of steering it at all, whereas Obama thought more it's a raging bull, but there's not a lot we can do stay the hell away from it. 
So in one case, there's obviously inadequate planning ahead of time for the aftermath of our own intervention. Um, and in the other, there's just virtually no intervention. And is that a fair analysis? Do you think they each might amend their approaches to those particular situations? Well, I, I think it's definitely true that um, I think they may have drawn very different lessons from it. Um, so just to go back, and I will try not to get into the weeds, Hillary Clinton was the decisive voice in the debate over intervening in, in Libya. Um, she wasn't the only voice, there were others, but she was really the person who was able to to, to bring President Obama around on that. He was very reluctant. He was being advised against it by Bob Gates, his Secretary of Defense, who thought that Libya was shaping up as another American war in the Middle East, uh, and that Libya was not a vital national interest to the US. Uh, so she was really the critical player in that. And um, she was also very important in the immediate aftermath in terms of trying to get a transitional government in place in Libya. But then other events intervened, and I think that both she and to some, and I think the president for sure, and she to some extent took their eye off the ball a little bit on Libya, were probably paying attention to things elsewhere in the world. And because the president had put such tight constraints on what the US would be willing to do beyond supporting the initial airstrikes, the US was really not able to have, had no leverage in kind of post Qaddafi Libya. And, uh, and, and it, it sort of fell apart. There was a security vacuum. Militants rushed in to fill the space. Uh, and Libya, uh, you know, fractured into this kind of um, uh, warring fiefdoms. Um, I think that the president's lesson, his takeaway from this was, it's going to have to take a lot for me to blunder into something like this again. And when he looked at Syria, he thought it had all the hallmarks of the same kind of situation. Syria is more sectarian, Libya is more tribal, but it was the same idea. And I think he just thought, you're not going to get me to do that again. Um, I think with Clinton, she would probably say that it would be great if we'd been able to put peacekeeping troops in place in Libya and stabilize the situation. In part, the, f the fault lay with the Libyans because they wouldn't let the outside world do that. Um, but rather than say, OK, that's going to make me swear off intervention, um, it clearly didn't. Because when Syria came along, she was among those who argued pretty vigorously for President Obama to uh, supply uh, arms to the moderate rebels. Uh, and there, the president was very reluctant. He turned uh, her and Petraeus down flat for the first several months of this debate. He grudgingly came around to it, but the amount of, re of, of weapons he authorized were such a trickle that they really never made a difference on the ground. And Hillary's argument, uh, and, those of, and that of her aides, is had we really been more robust early on, we at least had a shot in changing the equation on the ground, and we could have perhaps forced Bashar Assad to come to the table. You know, the president's argument, and he makes this argument uninvited because he feels that it's an argument that hasn't been properly aired, is that that would have made no difference. We would have funneled these arms to the rebels. We would not have changed the situation on the ground. Half of them would have wound up in the hands of really bad guys. Uh, and so he's very frustrated by this argument. I think her feeling is, well, nothing else we were trying was going to work, so why not try this? So that, that's how I would contrast the lessons they drew from, from those two episodes. You know, one of the, the really interesting things, and anybody who's worked in these administrations knows this, but it really comes through in your book also, uh, is this interesting cast of characters on whom each of them relies. And in both cases, they have some extremely young, uh, very talented, uh, but very, very young, uh, not terribly experienced in foreign policy advisors who command um, outsized influence uh, with their respective bosses. And then they also have you know, old pros. And in her case, you know, she had the alliance with Gates, which you talk a, a lot about in the book. Um, you know, and, and there's Biden floating around, there's Holbrook and S S Samantha Powell. I mean, there are a bunch of people who know a lot about this stuff, even if they have different points of view. He, Obama, really does not heed the advice sometimes of his war cabinet, not just on Syria, on uh, Ukraine. Um, he didn't really listen. He listened to the young guys on Mubarak, right? And so I'm really wondering, in the end, who do who really had the most influence with each of them? Would you say? Well, I I think with Obama, he's a little bit of a of an island. I mean, I think Obama had the most influence on Obama. And one of the things that fascinates me, if, after covering him for five years, 
is the extent to which he really relied on his own counsel, I think more so than most modern presidents. Um, he did have, he does have a core group of people that he trusts a great deal. And what, what's interesting about them is, as you said, Lisa, they're young. Um, they're not drawn uh, from you know the, the ranks of the democratic foreign policy as we commonly understand it. I, I'm sure many of you saw the profile that appeared in the New York Times Magazine of Ben Rhodes, but Ben is a, a very influential uh, advisor to President Obama, and that article became very controversial because Ben aired what you used to hear a lot inside the White House, which was kind of a contempt for the Democratic foreign policy establishment. And, and recall, Obama beat Clinton and hence vanquished the whole Democratic establishment and the foreign policy establishment. So I think there was in those early years a strong bias in the White House that these are people that we beat and we don't necessarily have to respect them and go along with what they say uh, in lockstep. Um, you know, on her side, I think it's more complicated again because she's older, has been around longer, um, but let's face it, she was a card-carrying member and symbol of the Democratic foreign policy establishment, starting with her husband, who was her most important advisor, uh, and even the young people around her, and I do talk about one of them, a couple of them, including Jake Sullivan, these are many members of the Democratic foreign policy establishment. They're on their way up the ranks to be the Richard Holbrooks of tomorrow in a way that I think the Obama people never viewed themselves. I, I, you know, Ben Rhodes has made the point over and over that when this presidency's finished, he's gonna leave Washington. He's not here for the next 25 years. I think that's different than the people that surround Hillary Clinton. Yeah, no doubt, and I, uh, um, no, I think you're absolutely right about that. It's just so interesting to me the, the, the amazing amount of influence that especially Jake and Ben Rhodes have had. Um, I wanna ask you, uh, and, and we'll get to questions in one second, I wanna ask one other question though first. Uh, Patrick Healy, who's your colleague, uh, wrote an interesting piece, I don't know if any of you saw it a day or two ago in the New York Times about really sort of speculating about whether in the face of Donald Trump, one of Hillary's greatest strengths would be her, her poise and her composure um, you know, with these sort of hostile forces uh, coming at her. And it reminded me of, uh, of, of a trip that we had when she was first lady. This is 1996, I think it was. And she was going to Central Europe to uh, kind of champion the new rising democracies, the emerging democracies, and we went to a bunch of places. We went to Czech Republic and she hung out with Václav Havel. And after that, we went to Slovakia, which um, you know, was also a supposedly emerging democracy, but sort of hadn't gotten the democracy memo fully yet. And um, and the prime minister was a guy named Vladimir Mechier, who was really a holdover from the old Communist Party thing. And so we get to Bratislava, the capital, and she um, she had been told ahead of time there was going to be a conference of NGOs in the capital when she got there, and um, he Mechier had proposed banning all NGOs as one of his, uh, you know, attempts to not be democratic, I guess. And so she decided as soon as we got there that rather than go f straight to the palace for her official meeting with him, she would just stop off and hang out with the NGO people and kind of give them some moral support. So we did that. And then we got to the meeting and she was meeting with him in the palace. And they sat on this big floral couch and he got right up next door. And he just thought he could sweet talk her. And he's like, oh, how is Chelsea? You know, how is the weather in Washington? And how are the flowers at the White House? And you know, she just sat there and she said, Mr. Prime Minister, you are suppressing the NGOs. You know, you are not democratic. You are, you know, and she just kept scolding him and scolding him. And with each scold, he would move an inch further away from her. <laughs> and by the end of the conversation, you know, he was at the far end of the couch and she was at this end of the couch. Um, and, and so that's, you know, and she's had to deal with a lot of really nasty, unsavory characters in both the diplomatic and political lives she's led. And you have a great story, and I'm not gonna get into it because you've gotta read it, but um, when her, about her first meeting with Putin at his DACA outside of Moscow where you guys all thought he had sandbagged her in front of the press and that she was gonna be furious and she sort of laughed it off and said, oh, he's just playing to his domestic audience because she kind of understood it. and it made me realize there is a part of her that really kind of relishes the gamesmanship of diplomacy, the gamesmanship of sort of the chess game of dealing with these, these even hostile uh, antagonistic leaders. 
And Obama, by contrast, seemed to me from reading your book, uh, really searches out people that he feels he is going to have an honest, true, personal connection with. He went a little too far on that with Medvedev in Russia. He, you say he was curiously uncritical of the president of Singapore, who despite having, you know, he could post it at the White House and he celebrated and he wouldn't criticize him on human rights, probably from his childhood reverence for him from living in Indonesia. So it, it's just interesting to me. I mean, he doesn't really care as much about personal diplomacy, does he? No, and I think you're right. I think with Obama, it was always a, he was always searching for people with whom he felt that he could have a very honest conversation. And sometimes they were unlikely uh, characters. I mean, Lee Myung Bak was the president of South Korea. He was kind of a chilly guy, um, but he appealed to Obama. He, he liked his intellect. He liked talking about education with him. Um, Angela Merkel, um, he's uh, he developed a, a true relationship with that only got soured, uh, you know, after um, she discovered that uh, Obama was wiretapping her cell phone. <laughs> um, uh, and 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 then, uh, interestingly, the b president of Turkey, uh, Erdogan. Uh, who's you know turned into a terrible disappointment for Obama? He initially thought he was a sort of a new kind of um, Muslim leader uh, that that he could really have rapport with. So it was with I think with Clinton the difference is she assumes she's dealing with a politician, and you know this could be the mayor of Chicago or the president of Afghanistan, and she kind of approaches relationships that way, and I think that allowed her in some ways to navigate these relationships. Uh, a little bit more easily than Obama. One that jumps to mind is she figured out how to deal reasonably well with um, Bibi Netanyahu, who's a very, you know, viewed as a really bullying, difficult character. A lot of foreign leaders don't like him. Um, she got along with him. She shouted at him. She used profanity with him. But it, it was a functional relationship. <laughs> President Obama... <laughs> President Obama has a non-functional relationship with Bibi Netanyahu. He really doesn't get along with them at all. The two of them hold each other in contempt. And, you know, that's been a problem for uh, U.S.-Israel relations. Not a, not an absolutely, um, you know, irredeemable problem because there's an, uh, the relationship is, occurs on many other levels. But this has been a real issue. And so I was, I do in the book uh, at, at various points try to talk about how these two people relate to other world leaders. And I think that's kind of the difference. Obama seems to want a real friend, and, uh, and Hillary knows she's not going to get one anyway, so she's just happy if she can do business with someone. Yeah. No, that, that comes clear. I, I want to invite anybody who'd like to ask a question to make your way um, to one of these microphones, because um, uh, I'm sure there are going to be plenty of questions. And um, sure, go ahead. Oh, already? OK, well. Um, well, I got so many, I, I, don't, I can't do too You're, many. You only have one um, for now. Only one? Only okay. one. Only one. Well, I guess I want to um, give it the biggest, sort of broadest one, and um, ha having to do with, say, your use of the twilight phrase in the, uh, in the subtitle. Most of the discussion has been about the Middle East and terrorism and so forth. A little bit about Russia. Essentially nothing, though, so far on Asia. A how lot do of they the differ? Book. How do they differ in um, terms of their approach to Asia, pivoting to Asia and so forth? In terms of assertiveness, and similarly um, for Russia, in terms of dealing with Putin and so forth. Or, um, well, just that. Well, and I mean, most important. How would you? What would you predict the uh, uh, Hillary Clinton foreign policy would be? You know, if she's elected. Well, I do, I do have a, a whole chapter on Asia, um, and I was a correspondent in Asia, so it's a, one that really interested me. Um, that's an, a d an interesting one because I don't think there's much of a divide in terms of their approach. They both wanted to focus heavily on Asia. I think they both felt that the Iraq War um, and the post-9-11 period had meant that the U.S. had neglected that part of the world somewhat. The U.S. always focused heavily on China, but the rest of the region had sort of been neglected. I think what's interesting is this was an administration that where most of the marquee foreign policy portfolios were controlled from within the White House. So Hillary Clinton in many cases, whether it was Iran or Russia or the Middle East, didn't have a great deal of leeway, and a lot of the 
uh, White House people were calling the shots. Asia was a, was was an exception. Um, the pivot to Asia really originated in the State Department, and uniquely among a, a major Obama initiatives was a State Department initiative. Um, what happened, and what I devote some attention to in this chapter, is the White House recognizing the value of this. Uh, basically co-opted it about two years into the administration, and the president really made it his own project. Um, but, you know, she continued to get a lot of credit. She got to go to Burma and engineer the opening with Aung San Suu Kyi, um, and she traveled to Asia, I think, more than any of her predecessors. It was also the first trip she made as Secretary of State. I think Lissa was on that trip with her. Was on it. Yeah. Um, uh, what was interesting to me, and I, I get at this in this chapter, is um, the sort of classic uh, Washington credit game. Um, because Asia was viewed as a reasonably successful project and initiative, um, both the State Department and the White House wanted credit for it. Um, and credit is a pretty vicious game in Washington, um, especially if you're fighting over a success. Um, and so what happened in the, in the, at the end of the first term is that Hillary, and I'll tell you one funny anecdote. I um, don't want to give away all my anecdotes, but this one's a funny one. So Hillary wanted to kind of summarize all her work in Asia in an article for Foreign Policy magazine. Um, and there w the president's national security advisor, Tom Donilon, wanted to put his stamp on the Asia policy. So he decided he was going to write a story, uh, an article for foreign affairs. So these two articles were heading down parallel tracks. And um, the White House is a very cautious place. And the article went through about 25 drafts. And they couldn't pull the trigger on it. So finally, the State Department just served notice that Hillary's was going to run uh, in the next two weeks. And, and Donilon and his staff freaked out. And they wanted her uh, to narrow the scope of it so he could still write the big grand strategic piece. So they joked around the State Department that they wanted her to focus on Indonesian agriculture from 1860 to 1890. Um, and they were constantly trying to get her to narrow it. And then finally, uh, the, the White House recognized there was no point. Some article needed to appear. So Hillary got the go-ahead. She, she, she wrote an article under the headline, America's Specific Century, which I said might as well have been called Clinton's Specific Century, because it really so closely tied her and the State Department to the policy. And then just to, to finish the anecdote, uh, peace appears. She and the president traveled to Asia. And Tom Donilon figures, well, I still have one more shot to put my stamp on everything. I can give the final news conference on the last day of the trip. So um, they assemble all the reporters at a resort in Bali that's um, you know, steps from the Indian Ocean. It's the last day of the trip. Um, the reporters have all been killing themselves and want to spend the afternoon on the beach. And Tom proceeds to kind of wheel into this lengthy, wonky discussion of our Asia policy. And within about five seconds, all the blackberries are lighting up of the White House staff saying, how long do we have to sit here? When can we go to the beach? And the, and the entire news conference is basically ignored. So in this kind of game of credit, um, I think Hillary won that round. <laughs> you know, just as a, as a little aside before we get to, to your question, um, but what's also interesting about the, 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 what you write about vis-a-vis -vis China is that she really did have a concept that um, was designed to use American influence power in other parts of Asia, mostly Southeast Asia, to sort of use leverage against the Chinese and try to get them a little bit more in line. And her cultivation of the Chinese leaders, in contrast to, I'm sorry, I sound like a shameless defender, but honestly, this part is kind of true, um, in contrast to Obama, who really had trouble uh, at the beginning. He didn't have any sort of personal chemistry. Um, uh, and so it caused him some problems, and China didn't know quite what to make of him. And she's sitting there, and you know, showing pictures of her daughter and looking at pictures of of Hu Jintao's grandchildren or whatever. And it sort of paid off in a weird way in the end. I mean, she had her stumbles too, not to not to, which you also describe in great detail. Yeah, I mean, because I feel obliged to kind of keep this even-handed. There, there's another well. There's another famous anecdote from that first trip, where uh, Hillary Clinton decided that. Um, one of the things that happens in a perfunctory way every time uh, American officials go to Beijing is that they sort of raise the same 
human rights objections, Tibet, Taiwan, um, these sorts of things. And, and Clinton felt that it was a kind of a sterile exercise. The Chinese know what we're going to say. They, they know what they're going to say back. So she figured she would just dispense with it. And we had a, a news con a round table meeting with her halfway through the trip. And she said, you know, I'm just not going to raise this with the Chinese because we all know what both sides are going to say. She got crucified for this back in Washington, um, particularly on Capitol Hill. And the next day, uh, she had to, at the White House's behest, uh, open a sheet of paper and read the lines, you know, the U.S. remains deeply concerned about human rights violations in China. So there were a few bumps for her along the way. But I just, very quickly, to answer the second half of your question, I think President Obama got pretty tough on China over time. Um, and so I'm not sure I expect a step change from Clinton. I think Clinton will continue to push the Chinese hard on the South China Sea. Um, one thing I am interested in um, is North Korea, because I feel like the policy we've had against North Korea, which has been more or less the same policy for eight years, is kind of reaching its sell-by date. And I'd be interested to see whether she has conceives of a new way to approach the North Koreans. I, I don't have the answer to that yet. It's just something I would be interested in. Thanks, Thanks for your question. Go ahead. Given the President's care or some would say reluctance regarding Libya, Syria, and perhaps even Ukraine. What do you think his reaction would be if there were an attempt by Putin to move into one of the Baltic republics, which are part of NATO, or if there's a military confrontation in the South China Sea between naval forces of the United States and China? Well, I think uh, the Baltics, because of the Article 5, uh, Def, you know, defense uh, provisions in the NATO um, treaty, I, I think he'd be obliged to uh, to respond to that, but I think he'd be very worried. And I think the, the case that he's made about Ukraine from the start is that um, it matters so much more to the Russians than it does to us. So any escalation, the phrase they use, it's very wonky, is escalation dominance. They, they will inevitably escalate more than we're willing to escalate. So I, I'm hoping that he, I mean, I guess the, the outcome is that, that uh, Putin may be crazy, but he's crazy like a fox, so he won't go that far. Um, on the South China Sea, that's a question of will there be an accident? I don't think the U.S. would ever provoke any kind of a confrontation over the South China Sea. I just don't, I think it's unlikely, but I do think there's a high potential for an accident, um, some sort of a clash between an American ship and a Chinese airplane, something like that that could escalate in an unintentional way. And I think that's, it, the unintentional aspect is what worries the U.S. about the South China Sea. I think in the case of Eastern Europe and the Baltics, there's more a hope that Putin knows how far he can push before the West will inevitably have to react. Thank you. Sir? I'd like to ask a serious question, but it may not sound like one. Based on what you know of the momentum of foreign policy over the last eight years, if the next president happens to be Donald Trump, do you think there's enough momentum that that foreign policy would continue, or would he bounce around or try to change things drastically? Um, it's it's an absolutely serious question, and it's kind of unanswerable because um, he's proven himself to be so um, erratic and contradictory so far. I mean, y one would hope that underneath all the bluster and bombast, he's kind of a pragmatist, uh, and there maybe there's some evidence for that. But the truth is, if you look at his recent foreign policy speech, it's it's just a farrago of different ideas. He doesn't. He wants to be out of the nation building business and avoid future Syrias and Libyas. Um, on the other hand, he wants to bomb ISIS into oblivion, do a massive military buildup, uh, and then he wants our allies to feel that we're reliable and predictable. But meanwhile, he wants to pull financial support for the NATO alliance and the nuclear security umbrella over East Asia. So th in three different areas, he's contradicting himself. And, and by the way, I would argue just to sort of sh tee up the coming general election debate, this is not going to be easy for Hillary Clinton to handle because he can attack her uh, from the right and the left, which is very unusual for a democratic debate. Normally, Democrats are fighting uh, a s national security hawk uh, and she's pretty well placed for that kind of a debate, given where she comes from. But he can say, well, I, I opposed the Iraq war and you supported it. 
um, and I oppose paying too much money for NATO and you support it. And then on the other hand, he can say, and by the way, you got us into Libya and Syria and I would avoid those messes uh, and I would more effectively fight ISIS than you will or have or did as Secretary of State. So I think that th she actually faces a sort of a tricky foreign policy debate against Trump and my sense is the way she will try to deal with that is to make a very simple argument, which is he's just temperamentally unfit and unsuited to be commander in chief. Yeah. No, I think that's that's probably right. But you're right. It, people seem to think that you know she's going to walk to the White House in a landslide, and I'm afraid that may not be the case. Um, much as I would love it, um, but no, I think this foreign policy. He's so. Uh, non-categorizable and she's also as as mark was saying oh she's viewed as part of the establishment and this is if anything this is the year of the insurgent anti-establishment mood on everything and she'll also you know sh he'll try to kill her on china and you know there's it, you just sort of go around the world and pick your spot but sir go ahead um given the last few years in uh, japan we've seen a movement towards trying to redefine their stat their military status and amending their constitution Assuming that continues in that direction, how do you see Hillary Clinton as president sort of navigating our relationship with Japan via South Korea and with China? Well, uh, let me, I mean, I, I should say up front, I'm not a Japan ex expert, so I, I don't want to sort of delve too deeply into where I think Japan is going. As a general rule, she would very strongly favor continuing all the security alliances that we have in East Asia, and, and unlike Trump, um, you know, argue very strongly that, that the Japanese should continue to rely as much on the security umbrella as they have in the past. Um, she spent a, a lot of time going to Japan uh, and building relationships there. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see that Japan is going to be a major um, issue unless the Japanese and the Chinese have a major conflicts in the East China Sea, which they have had already. Um, uh, but in terms of the actual direction inside Japan, it goes a little bit beyond my sort of expertise. Uh, Mark mentioned that her first trip as Secretary of State was to Asia. Her first stop very intentionally on that trip was in Japan. I have a few um, disagreements with you. Okay. And <laughs> the first disagreement... Uh, I hope you I can put them in the form of a question. I'm going to try. Okay. Um, the first thing, I'm from the Caribbean, so I would like a lot of this about Asia and Middle East. Um, if she wins, right? And maybe also if Donald Trump wins, right? <laughs> what do you see and how do you see U.S. Um, policy um, differ vis-a-vis -vis, um, the Caribbean and Latin America? The first question. The big problem I have here is it was said, I think, by you that uh, the Balkans was kind of a for her positive development, right, in international intervention. Obviously, the problem with that is that would be highly criticized by many people on the left, right? They saw the Balkan as being, creating a chaos of, of, of slaughter and murder there uh, due to the bombing, right, and due to the, um, the in essence, the um, provoking of uh, uh, the leader in Serbia to attack uh, the uh, Balkan Serbs, so, I mean the Balkan Muslims. So. Um, how how do you um, put this together, right? The last question being, and the most important, right? It was said that she is kind of close to a lot of military men, right? Do you believe because she's so close to a lot of military men, right? That being being the first uh, female president in the United States, right? She could be under pressure to sh to show that she has cojones, that she's tough internationally, right? that uh, you don't piss around with us because we'll just bomb you and something like that. Um, do you believe that she, over what happened in Libya and all these different things, may have changed her view on these things? Or that she will be under so much pressure, if anything problematical happens, to basically, uh, basically to, to, you know, to, 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 to be militarily aggressive? Thank you. Um, well, I'll take, th I'll take those in, um, I guess, reverse order. So. I'll take them in order. Um, the, on the on Latin America, um, I do have a chapter in this book that, te that deals with the opening to Cuba, and I try to put that into a regional context because, I mean, I think what drove Cuba more than anything else was a recognition that as long as we didn't uh, kind of change this dysfunctional arrangement, it was going to basically screw up our relationships all around the region, um, and the pressure to do the Cuba opening 
um, didn't come, it, it came principally from other Latin American leaders, Santos and Colombia being a big example of that. Um, Clinton had a very interesting role in that. She came in as a classic 1990s Democrat on Cuba. Remember, her husband was in office when the Helms-Burton Act was passed. Um, so she was sort of temperamentally interested in changing things, but I think it wasn't necessarily at the top of her list of agenda items. Uh, for President Obama, it fell into the category of I'm willing to talk to old foes. Um, and so I think he might have been a little more forward-leaning. But I think what happened in the early uh, years of her time as Secretary of State is she went to Latin America a few times, and every meeting she went to, she just got hammered by people saying, you have to do something about Cuba because it's sort of a, a roadblock for you all over the region. And she, in fact, was one of the people that came back and told President Obama what a problem our Cuba policy was. And uh, by the time she left the State Department, she wrote a memo. She wrote a number of exit memos to the President on a variety of issues, Putin uh, and other things. But one was about uh, urging him to push Congress to lift the trade embargo sometime during his second term. So she doesn't get a lot of credit for the Cuba opening. I mean, that's very much an Obama-driven project. He did it with a small group of, of advisors. Um, but I think she laid some of the predicate for it. And so I think that she actually would be a pretty active president in Latin America. Um, she Because she she learned a lot during her time as, as Secretary of State. And I think that probably you'd see her build on the Cuba opening, uh, and, and, and that would be an area of focus for her. On uh, Very quickly on the um, question of cojones, I mean, it's a valid question. A lot of people have always assumed that uh, her hawkishness was as much political calculation as deeply held principle. Uh, my contention in the book is that there's a lot of deeply held principle there because of who she is and where she came from. That said, there's no question that in the post-9-11 period, as a senator from New York, she recognized the political imperative of looking strong on national security. Um, but it's funny, when you say, would she be rolled by the generals, you know, I'm not convinced. I mean, after all, it was the anti-war president who came into office and in the first Afghanistan troop debate arguably got rolled by the generals. So I almost wonder sometimes if you come in with a... A uh, strong set of beliefs that tend toward the hawkishness, the hawkish side. Maybe it actually makes you s more uh, able to say to these guys, "Look, I, I kind of am with you guys, but I'm not going to do that." So I actually think, in a way, her years of experience with the generals and her ease of communication with them might equip her better to say, "This is what I'm willing to do, but this is what I'm not willing to do." And I also think it's it's. Um um, what's the word I'm looking for that's polite? Um, a little bit too stereotypic to suggest that because she's a woman, she would somehow feel she needs to exert her, her muscularity, as it were, militarily. I think, uh, uh, you know, Obama and Clinton, the two of them, and many more people around them and people in the, those positions, they take these roles amazingly seriously. They don't, they would never, I don't think, risk um, an intervention of any kind without tremendous amount of thought. Now, that doesn't mean they wouldn't differ on whether to or not, but it wouldn't happen reflexively or impulsively or based on some sort of emotional need, I don't think. So I think you can feel assured that if it were to happen, it would be, it would be based on something other than her gender or her relationship to the generals. Uh, I, I think we have time for uh, just these last few questions. I wonder if you can comment about the difference between them in the issue of the Palestinian and Israelis and the how to deal with Iran and the whole nuclear issue with Iran. Um, sure. The, so the question was, what are the differences between them on the Israeli and Palestinian issue? Uh, and then, you know, connected to that on the uh, Iran nuclear talks. Um, and that's a major part of this book. Um, I guess I would characterize them this way. President Obama r came into office really hoping, uh, and he's not the first president who's done this, but he did it in a very aggressive way to kind of change the traditional relationship um, between the U.S. and Israel where, you know, we generally back the Israelis and hold them very close and hope that by doing so we can cajole them into making the territorial accommodations that they need to uh, to achieve a two-state solution. I think he thought he was going to come in 
did come in uh, with a little more of a tough love approach um, that, that you really need to, if you want to buy any credibility with the Arabs, you have to be a little tough with the Israelis on, on the issue of settlements, principally. So he made settlements an enormous focus. I don't think Hillary, or oh, I know Hillary did not think this was a particularly good idea. It's not that she isn't also opposed to settlements. I think she felt that pounding the Israelis on settlements in a public way was going to provoke a backlash. Now, that said, this was a great illustration of Hillary, loyal soldier. Uh, not only did she go along with the policy, she became the most forceful advocate for it um, and got herself into trouble um, from time to time, either by being sometimes too unyielding in the way she phrased it, or then subsequently when Bibi Netanyahu actually agreed to a 10-month moratorium on building, uh, she kind of made a bigger deal out of it than it probably deserved at the time. And I attribute those... Um, it's a sort of rare examples in this case where Hillary didn't get the tone right, and in a way the reason I, I think that's the case is because she didn't necessarily totally subscribe to the policy, so she found it very difficult to figure out how to calibrate her public expression of it. Um, now where that plays into Iran, um, she's much more skeptical of the Iranian leadership and was from the very beginning. It was obvious and public and well debated during the 2008 campaign. Um, the role that she adopted uh, was, in short, was the bad cop role. She was the one who, who got the world to line up and impose sanctions on Iran, which were very important because that's what pulled Iran to the negotiating table. On the diplomatic side, my argument is that she was much more skeptical, cautious, and backward leaning, and that some of the secret talks that predated the public diplomacy, um, she was not the key driver. To some extent, I argue, John Kerry was in his capacity as a senator um, and President Obama, and that while Hillary went along with it, she was not really forward leaning on it. Um, so they each played their role. President Obama, I think, took a few more risks diplomatically. Hillary was very important in lining up sanctions. Um, to, to circle back to Israel, the interesting question, there's two, que there's two questions that are interesting. One, would we ever have done an Iranian nuclear deal if she'd been elected in 2008? I have my doubts. I don't know whether she ever would have gotten over the suspicion with the Iranian leadership. Um, so I, I think it's, it's plausible we never would have done that deal. Um, second question, though, um, on the Middle East peace process and the Israelis and Palestinians, she was not forward-leaning on this. I mean, Lissa may disagree, but I, I, I think she played this one safe from the very beginning. Uh, I think she did so for a couple of reasons. One, she didn't think that the leadership I, on either side was in any way uh, really committed to making a deal happen, either uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the Palestinian leader, or Netanyahu. So she saw this as a high-risk, low-probability undertaking, and one that carries a domestic political risk. You can't really forge into this without offending a few people uh, in the U.S., uh, people who vote. So I think that she made a decision to keep it somewhat at arm's length. I don't think that means she would necessarily do that as president. And I thought it was very interesting that last fall in the Jewish Forward, she wrote an op-ed piece about the Middle East. And in it, she said that one of her top priorities would be uh, a two-state solution and an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So this is a case where I think uh, being Secretary of State and being president are very different. And I wouldn't necessarily assume that we wouldn't see her try in this regard. Um, but on Iran, I think her job would be to be the enforcer of this deal and to continue to be very tough on them. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, there's, it's not a coincidence that she had a special envoy yeah. to the Middle East and really didn't immerse herself day in and day out in that. Yeah. Um, I just want to say one of the things you say that really gets to your, your other question. You say, that, and I'm not sure if you were quoting somebody in this, I can't remember, but that she viewed statecraft less as an, an idealistic enterprise than as a cold-blooded exercise in balancing power. And when you think about Iran, that's a perfect example of that. Um, we have time for you, and I think there was one more person there. Okay, so if you could make your questions reasonably quick, that would be great. That will be quick. Hi, Mark. Hi, Alex. Um, this is a non-wonky question in this very Fabulous. wonky crowd. No offense. Um, can you talk about the personal relationship between them and how did they negotiate their differences and how did they, I don't know what the typical relationship is between these, between President and Secretary of State, but I'm curious about how they 
it's dealt a, with it's this. a great question, and um, I I can't confess that I plumb the innermost secrets of these two, um, but you know, secretaries of state and presidents come in various different formulations. Kissinger and Nixon basically spent half of every day together um, and schemed and dreamed and talked and you know they were really soulmates in a in a weird way although very competitive um, Baker and Bush uh, were sort of president and consigliere where you know Baker was really the president's lawyer even when he was Secretary of State and in both of those relationships the Secretary of State drew enormous power because they were really a proxy for the president Hillary and Obama very different, right? Mm -hmm. Independent political figures with enormous reputations who spent the first year to year and a half getting to know one another and getting past the bitterness of the race right. so um, and I actually in my first chapter get at this and one of the things that I report is that um, that she was asked early on, this goes back to the Israel issue, um, the president's advisors asked her early on whether she would travel to Israel in the immediate aftermath of President Obama's speech to the Islamic world in Cairo because they thought this would be a good way to avoid sort of snubbing the Israelis. Um, and she refused. Uh, it was Rahm Emanuel who put this request to her and she said no. Um, I think her view was, well, if he thinks it's so important he should go himself. And the problem that the president's people had with that was that they thought she was still thinking like an independent political figure with her own interests rather than a member of his team. Um, at the end of that year, 2009, uh, I also recount the tale of her asking the president to fly to the Copenhagen Climate Summit to help her basically unstick this paralyzed meeting. And I, I won't go into the D. It's a great anecdote. It's in the book. Um, but this was a moment where the two of them really bonded and I think felt that they were very much on the same team. Um, and I think those two events for me set the tone of a relationship that I, I always thought had both elements of competition and rivalry and um, you know, loyalty and, and camaraderie. Um, and the way I like to think of it is, Obama became really close to Joe Biden, uh, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very heartfelt relationship. Um, I don't think that level of, of, of personal uh, affinity exists between Obama and Clinton. At the same time, Obama never ha treated John Kerry with the kind of respect he treated Hillary Clinton because I think he knew Hil he viewed Hillary Clinton as just being on a sort of a different level. So it's that kind of relationship, one that one of respect uh, and you know um, and and regard, but not necessarily deeply felt emotion and and some mutual utility, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. Last uh, last well, last question. I'm gonna have one final question, but go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. You mentioned earlier that it's the year of the anti-establishment, whether it's Trump's America's first or Bernie Sanders' not continuation of the mainstream foreign policy. Uh, but you also discussed that back in 08, the Obama administration came in thinking they had an alternative to the foreign policy establishment. And he still thinks that today, arguably, with the Goldberg article in The Atlantic, that he's torn up the foreign policy playbook. So at the end of the day, does the president fit in an establishment or anti-establishment foreign policy, or has he blazed a kind of new trail over the past eight years? What's your assessment? I think he has tried to blaze a new trail, and I would argue he has been anti-establishment. Um, now, it is a truism of every president that about six months or 12 months into their term, every one of the people in my job write an article that says, hey, the president didn't change as much as we thought he was going to. And that was true of Obama with, with Bush. I mean, he came in and within six months, or, and particularly after 12 months, if you remember the Northwest Airlines um, underwear bomber episode where he narrowly missed a terrorist attack on American soil and discovered that he actually liked using drones and covert warfare. Um, so there, there is continuity. And there, and you know, there would be continuity, frankly, r whether it was Trump or Clinton uh, coming after Obama. But I think it's fair to argue that on foreign policy, um, he had a he had a and has a radical message. And Jeff Goldberg captured that very well in in that interview. Um, it's not an easy message, and that's why I think Obama is giving interviews trying to formulate it because the 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 heart of that message is that we're no longer. Uh, the undisputed hegemon, we're no longer the indispensable nation, we should define our interests more narrowly. And that's a very difficult message to make appealing to the American people. And I think that's where Obama struggled. Um, and I think in a way, 
Hillary Clinton would present a more appealing message because it would be a little bit more of a throwback to where we have been in the post-war period. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I just want to say uh, we have only scratched the surface. I'm just thinking about the whole issue of intelligence versus military strength as a as a sort of uh, central point of foreign policy we haven't even talked about, which is a lot of what Mark talks about in the book as well. Lots of other parts of the world that are interesting. I can tell from your questions that um, you have a lot of questions. So can I just suggest that you buy the book and read the book? Uh, because it really it is just, it's such a fantastic uh, work of journalism. I think you'll all really enjoy it. And before we break up, Mark will sign up here. If you don't have a copy, you can get one up front. Um, but just on the last point, this is going to see how good you are at sort of campaign sloganing. So, and forgive the uh, crude language, but Obama did say at the beginning of his tenure as president that foreign policy really came down to not doing stupid shit. What will President Clinton's equal mantra be, would you say? <laughs> and if he's stumped, we'll just go to the signing line. No. Do, uh, do the right shit? <laughs> do know. the right shit. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming out. And um, Mark, thank you. Thank you so much.